My name is Jamie Duggan. I'm with the Division for Historic Preservation. And uh, I wanted to just start out real quickly. Uh, Kim Bent here from Lost Nation Theater is going to just give us a quick intro as our host here to the space. Yes. Yeah, just a pleasure to welcome you all here. I just thought it might be a good idea to give you an idea of where you are. And it, in this, this space, that I think is a, a wonderful example of a public-private partnership that's been in place for 31 years now, Lost Nation Theater and the city of Montpelier working together helping this happen. Uh, when we first came into this space, there was plaster falling from the ceiling, there were no curtains on the windows, it was very kind of run down and hardly used at all in 1989. And we started doing some summer theater here. And we worked with the City Hall Improvement Committee for four or five years uh, to eventually pass a bond code to fund some improvements for the facility. And uh, so in nine, 1995, we were able to do a, um, a complete overhaul of the space. We got the curtains on the windows, we got the lighting grid, uh, we got the entire interior repainted and, uh, and the space sprinklered for safety. So um, all of that happened in 95, and from then we you know, continued. Uh, Los Asia Theater is essentially the manager of the space for the city. When we're not using this facility, uh, we function as uh, uh, the manager for other people who want to rent the space, and so we provide technical support for them and so on. So it's really a wonderful partnership that's evolved and, and has made all this possible over the last 31 years. Um, yeah, so uh, the, what your, this um, environment that you're working in today is uh, have somewhat of a circus, circusy feel because the current show we're performing is the history of comedy abridged. We're in the second weekend of the run and we're running through uh, June 16th. So if you have, can come back and see us, you can see the theater in action. I also just want to explain that um, this theater space, actually this, this chamber theater environment gets set up in March every year and then we take it down so it's just a big empty room for other people to use however they want to for the rest of the year. So it's a lot of work involved but it's really, we think it's really worth it. It provides the possibility for this facility to be used uh, pretty much 200 days out of the year so for things to happen here throughout throughout the year. So uh, oh, and thank, congratulations and thanks for all you do to help make downtown this free. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, readiness and resiliency for cultural and historic properties. And uh, I think um, we, we're all aware that there are changes that have been happening in our weather patterns and uh, other impacts that have um, created situations which need a response. And, in our role, uh, my role at the division, and, um, and working through some of these projects after the fact, uh, or after an incident, we see all too often how, um, without proper planning in place ahead of time, it makes the job that much harder to reach those goals. And um, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're seeing it all around, and there's a lot of communities all around the country that are being dealt with issues of climate change, a lot of coastal uh, places that are uh, dealing with sea level rise. We're also seeing it here, though, in, uh, in some concentrated areas and repeatedly. And um, being able to respond is, um, and to know what needs to happen is a real critical part of that. One of the first steps uh, in all of this is um, doing some survey work and planning, understanding the resources that you have so that you can then respond when you see what those effects are. So we've got a great panel here today. Um, Emily Harris and Lauren Notes from Vermont Emergency Management. Seth Jensen from uh, the Memorial County Regional Planning Commission. Rachel Ona from uh, Vermont State Archives and Ben Harris from Historic New England. And uh, I'm just gonna uh, let these folks get right into the content here. Uh, and we've left a generous section at the end for some discussion and questions and answers. I'm sure there'll be a lot that will come up through the presentations uh, that you might have some questions about, and we hope to have a good dialogue at the end. So, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Emily. Thanks. Thank you so much. So, um, as uh, 
Oh my goodness. Your name. Jamie. Jamie. <laughs> As Jamie just said, I'm Emily Harris from Vermont Emergency Management. I'm the Interim Engagement Section Chief there, meaning we provide planning, training, and exercise support to communities and organizations throughout Vermont. Um, and today I'm going to touch on emergency planning, which I'm hoping all of you recognize is very important because you're here today. So why do we want to make sure we're prepared? Um, first, because emergencies can happen anytime. Emergencies don't take a vacation. They don't say, well, it's a holiday or this is a very important day for us. In fact, I was in this very room about, I think it was two years ago, seeing a show, and the fire alarm went off. Now, luckily, it was just, I believe, a toaster in the youth center downstairs that caused the alarm to go off. And so we were able to quickly exit, gather, fire department showed up, and then we were able to come back in in no time. But that could have been a much bigger incident. And so because this uh, facility is prepared, they had prepared all of their staff to lead people outside calmly, ensure everyone vacated the building, ensure everyone went to the rally points. Um, and then they had a plan for how we were going to return. Now, I haven't seen their plan, but I'm also hoping that they've got a plan for what they would do if we couldn't come back to this building. Maybe there's another building that they share resources with where the show could go on should this facility not be available. By having plans in place, it reduces fear, fear and anxiety amongst ourselves, as well as our staff and those folks that we're serving, so that they know that we're taking care of it. That if we were to have to vacate the building or um, we were flooded out for months before we could return, payroll's going to continue functioning. We're going to be able to save our records that are really important and they're not going to be lost. And one thing that you folks need to be aware of is that resources are going to be exceptionally limited during a disaster. So our first responders are first and foremost saving lives um, and um, preventing injuries. That is always their number one priority. Next is making sure the thing that's happening stops happening. So if there's a hazmat spill, it's stopping that spill from continuing and spreading further. And then finally, that third bullet is protecting the property and the environment. So you need to be prepared that in those first few hours and maybe even first few days, you folks may not be high on a priority list for first responders to come in and take their collections out and help you out. So you should have a plan in place ahead of time. You should discuss that with your first response organizations so that way they know that you have a plan and they can help you with your plan. Because if your plan is that we're going to drive all our collections this way, they may be able to tell you, well, the hazard that's going to impact your building is actually also going to impact that building, and maybe that's not a great idea. So talk to your first response organizations. Every town has an emergency management director who is versed in emergency management, who maintains a local emergency management plan. Have conversations with them ahead of time. So how do you actually plan for emergencies? The first step is to form a collaborative planning team. So as I said, make sure you're including your first response organizations and your emergency management director, but also consider uh, including volunteers and donors and staff, people who have different information about your particular uh, facility, um, to make sure that you've got a full understanding of what the vulnerabilities are and what the priorities are. Then you want to understand the situation, and that's figuring out what threats and hazards are most likely to impact you. So as many folks are aware, we're in Montpelier. Water is a pretty big problem in Montpelier. As a resident of Montpelier, I identify this is a very big problem. In fact, this building is actually in a flood hazard area. So you need to know what are the hazards that are most likely to impact your building, and how would those hazards impact your building? So maybe you've got a bunch of critical documents, and you're doing a great job about not storing those in the basement or on the first level. You've got them high up. But what happens if you lose power for an extended period of time? Do some of your um, Items actually uh, need to be refrigerated, or uh, need to have air conditioning, need to have heat. Would there be a problem if your building was without power for an extended period of time? So plan out what you would do in those circumstances. Then you want to come up with your goals and objectives. What are we hoping to accomplish? And again, working on this as a collaborative planning team. You develop that plan together. You then uh, make sure that your plan is reviewed by all of the folks that have been participating in the planning process and that you adopt it. And then you can test that plan. You can go through an exercise. An exercise can be simply having a conversation to say, OK, let's pretend that it's Christmas Day and something's happening at our building. There's been a big hazmat spill outside of it. How would we even be notified that that was happening? Do people have our contact information? How would we notify staff? 
What about volunteers that we've already identified that would come and help us in this situation? How would we notify them? So test out that plan, have those conversations. And Vermont Emergency Management is here to help you. We have a lot of courses on how to do these sorts of exercises so you can do them on your own, or we can help you come up with some general concepts for how you could do it. There are a lot of resources available for you. So one is, uh, who here has seen the ANR Flood Ready Atlas? Okay. It's an excellent resource. It talks about the flood hazard areas. It shows you brownfield sites. It shows you uh, has, uh, hazardous material producing area uh, um, buildings. And this really gives you a good understanding of some of the threats and hazards that may be impacting your building. Um, has everyone here registered for Vermont Alert? Raise a hand. Vermont Alert? OK. So Vermont Alert is one of the ways that you can be notified that something is happening in your community. Again, I live in Montpelier, so I have personally registered for Vermont Alert, and I have said, I care about parking vans, because I just do. I care about hazmat incidents. I care about road closures. I care about uh, water issues. And so I told the system, which you can access at uh, vtalert.gov, that I want to be texted first, then I want you to send me an email that'll have more details, and I don't want a phone call, but a lot of people do. So you identify how you want to be notified, and you can also set quiet hours. So for example, I don't care if there's a winter weather advisory at 4 a.m. So I set quiet hours for advisories between the hours of midnight and I think 5 a.m. to say, please don't call me at that time, don't send me a text. So that's something that you can do. Uh, the federal government, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has a bunch of resources at ready.gov. I'd strongly encourage you to check it out. And then there are also um, courses available to you. Um, sorry, I just need to actually see this here. Um, so FEMA's put together a, a unified federal review advisory training. This is something that they recommend for cultural and historical institutions to take. Um, as well as community planning for disaster recovery. And that's an in-person class that we're actually gonna be having in Waterbury uh, coming up on July 11th. Um, and I also mentioned to you that your local emergency management director is a great resource. Uh, if you don't know who your local emergency management director is, you can ask your town hall um, or you can give us a call at Vermont Emergency Management. Uh, our phone number's up here. It is 1-800-347-0488. If you call that between 7.45 in the morning and 4.30 at night, you can just say, here's who I am and what I'm looking for, and they'll direct you to the appropriate person. So that's my really quick slide. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon. My name is Rachel Onuf, and I'm at the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a very new initiative here in the state, um, very new, um, to build a resilient network for our state's arts, cultural, and historic organizations. And this is not happening in a, in a vacuum. To give you a little bit of context, about 10 years ago, there was a group called VCHART, um, which stood for Vermont Cultural Heritage and Art Recovery Team, that had a big forum with about 95 people who came. Was anyone there? Was at the Billings Farm? Um, and again, this is 2009, this was not inspired by Irene, this was pre-Irene. They were developing um, a local chapter of the National Alliance for Response Network. The trouble was trying to sustain that over time. Um, they met a couple more times. Um, there was some follow-up activity with uh, the Northeast Document Conservation Center who came and did some Vermont Prepares workshops and trainings that were helping organizations to develop disaster plans that have emergency plan that Emily was just talking about for their, for their repository. Town clerks, historical societies, and museums all participated in that. But this organization had been more of them for some time. Um, so that's, that's happening in the background. And then in May 2017, um, Vermont Secretary of State Jim Condos agreed to fund and get matching federal funds eventually, um, a program at the State Archives um, the Vermont Records, Historical Records Program. So I started on a part-time basis then, and about a year later, again, with additional funding, um, it became a full-time position, and so I've been doing that for about a year. One of the first things I did, um, and in my role, I run around and do site visits, um, both one-on-one -on -one with historical societies and museums and town clerks. I run trainings and workshops. Um, but I also try to build statewide capacity. And 
find more ways that I can support these organizations. I was the roving archivist in Massachusetts before I came up to Vermont, and I had a suite of things I could offer to places. You need scanning done, Boston Public Library does it for free. You need a digital repository, Digital Commonwealth is there for $50 a year. Uh, you need some supplies, oh yeah, the Shrav will give you some money for supplies. It takes about half an hour to write an application and they never say no. So I got here and they were kind of, what have we got? Um, and one of the things that I heard most from sites, you know, all of that other stuff would be great, but they were concerned about emergencies, about being able to respond in the event of a disaster. I think that the, the memory of Irene still was running strong, it still does. Um, so that, I was getting that, that kind of feedback from the sites I visited, and then the Mellon Foundation was making money available through the Performing Arts Readiness Project for starting up emergency preparedness and response networks that would involve performing arts organizations. So I applied for and got some funding to develop a network here in Vermont. Um, was thrilled to have the Vermont Arts Council, Michelle Bailey and Amy Cunningham are my co-leads on this project. We used the funding to bring in a really talented facilitator, Mary Margaret Schoenfeld, and we've had three organizing, organizing meetings so far, um, and have been using a, uh, a guide called the Cultural Placekeeping Guide that came out from the Americans from the Arts. Um, that's been kind of our, 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 our primer for how to go through this process. And we finally, finally came up with a name at this last meeting last week. It's, it's not awesome, but back darn. <laughs> but it was important, and I will say that this, we had a wonderful group of, of stakeholders at these meetings, including folks from Vermont Emergency Management, um, from arts organizations, from historical records repositories, um, trying to put out as big an umbrella as we could. And we intend to work with individual studio artists as well um, as we move forward with this initiative. So um, it was important we decided this meeting to have resilience in the name. That was kind of one of the things that came out and what prompted this particular acronym. It actually is something you can say, which was challenging with all the different words we were trying to get into the name. And we've really been focusing on what our, what our network actions will be and when we're going to, when we're going to be active. Um, we're still working on how we're going to be structured. There's probably going to be a steering committee and some co-chairs. We'll probably continue on in that role, um, at least for the short term. And we intend to operate year-round uh, with regular communication in down times, um, as well as in the lead-up and uh, after disasters. During disasters, we plan to stay out of the way and let the first responders and Vermont Emergency Management do what they need to do and make sure everyone is safe and as Emily was saying, there is a, a recognition and acknowledgement that the repositories, the materials, the historic sites are not necessarily going to be top priority. But one thing we hope to do as a network is to help you be better prepared in the event of these disasters happening and to facilitate quick recovery um, at the, as soon as you do get the green light to be able to enter those spaces again. Um, the intent for communication among members, which is a really important part of this network, is that we'll maintain contact lists um, at the member level, so they'll push things out, push out information to their people who are on their list. So we won't have any one master list, but Department of Libraries, Vermont Arts Council, um, Vermont Historical Society will all push out communication um, to their listservs that they're maintaining anyway. Um, we will promote existing training, things like what Vermont Emergency Management offers all the time, wonderful trainings, um, as well as develop more collections-oriented trainings of our own. Um, and I've done some of that already with, with some organizations around the state, helping them both with awareness of what they can do, developing risk assessments, developing disaster plans, so that's stuff that, again, my program offers for free to communities. Um, so please talk to me after if you're interested. Um, we'll have a website coming soon where we'll curate, have curated information available, uh, as well as offer a space for folks to share information with each other, with that kind of lateral learning that was evoked in an earlier session today. We also want to promote the role of arts and cultural organizations after a disaster and how they can help build their communities back up, help them heal, help them become more resilient. And often, after such an event, 
the artists are some of the first to step forward and say, I'll, I'll do a benefit concert, or let's get some art going here, or let's, let's this is an, an awful um, barrier board, let's, let's make it beautiful. Um, so wanting to support and promote that role, which can be so vital for all of us. We're going to be launching this network at the Chandler Center for the Arts in Royalton. Um, I would invite any of you to come and have a full day of presentations. There'll be some trainings, discussion, and a chance just to spend some time together. And one thing I think we're hearing during today's talks is the value and the importance of gatherings um, to placekeeping and to building these networks and to building that kind of community, community together. Briefly, just want to tell you about some related initiatives that are going on. One of them um, involves people with the State Historic Preservation Office, including Elizabeth, um, of mapping cultural assets. And what you see represented there are all the different historical societies in the state. So we can use um, ArcGIS. The intent is to make this be a layer in our planning atlas that the state maintains. Um, and as a test case, we're doing the historical societies and state historic sites. And there would be public metadata available, some basic contact information and address. But we're talking about what we might also maintain kind of on the back end about their, the level of readiness of these various sites. Um, do they have sprinkler systems? Do they have a disaster plan? Who are their other emergency contact names? Um, and we can use this in powerful ways, overlay it with things like the flood, the floodplain um, layer and see where are communities that are most at risk and can we be proactive and go out and engage with them and help them make sure that they are aware of where they are and how they could maybe mitigate the risks that they're facing. Um, also have been working for a while uh, with, uh, with purchasing department here at the state to establish a contingency contract with a disaster recovery vendor. This would be for collections materials. If your historic records or other cultural materials did get damaged in the event of uh, a disaster, they would be available um, at, at, the, at the, the agreed upon price that they set with the state. And that would be um, an opportunity that's available not just for municipalities and state government agencies, um, but for historical societies and other cultural heritage repositories as well. And then the third thing, just to be aware of, is that DPLAN, uh, which is an online disaster, um, disaster plan template tool, is getting an upgrade and will be available hopefully later this year. That's been funded also by the Mellon Foundation and is going to be um, a more flexible tool than it's been in the past uh, and hopefully be scalable to smaller institutions and applicable for performing arts and other arts organizations, as well as the cultural heritage community that it was initially developed for. And with that, I will hand this over to Lauren. Thank you. I'm actually going to pull this off and do the awkward uh, stand-up comedian shuffle across the stage. All right, so my name is Lauren Oates. I see a couple of familiar faces in here, but not that many. I'm the State Hazard Mitigation Officer at Vermont Emergency Management. And so while Emily just talked to you all about emergency planning and your ability to respond to and be prepared for disaster, I'm kind of here to talk to you all about how to try to avoid disaster altogether. So that while you should still be prepared for and planned for, um, hopefully we don't have to worry about that in the future. So while Jamie at the beginning kind of alluded to climate change, um, my work resolve, revolves around that quite a bit. So the number one and two natural hazards in the state of Vermont are fluvial erosion and flood inundation respectively. So water, water's our problem in Vermont. There are a couple others, but they're, they're much less significant. We see much less issues with them than we do with water. So we have historic development patterns in the state of Vermont, a lot of our downtown Downtown areas are along floodplains. Emily already referenced this very building, maybe not on the second floor we are now, but the footprint of this building is within the floodplain, as are several dozen other structures in the city of Montpelier, and that's just this city. That doesn't talk about all the other villages and downtown centers that we have across the state. So it's definitely on my mind regularly that we have not only structures that are important uh, critical facilities, but also cultural and historic facilities that are important to our everyday business economy to our um, our references to our past and what we plan to do in the future. So we need to be prepared for uh, and resilient to 
um, especially water. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And luckily, I don't have to get into too many specifics because Seth's actually going to talk to you about what this looks like boots on the ground. Actually, before I get into this, I'm going to go back because I don't want you to see that. Uh, <laughs> this will be kind of helpful for me in this, but it will also be helpful in the Q&A later. Uh, can I get a show of hands for people from state agencies in the room? State agencies? How about any federal agencies? No feds. Uh, how about a local organization, historic society member? Nonprofit organizations? Uh, regional planners? Seth. Uh, and academics. Great. Okay, that's helpful. It's a pretty good spread, actually. So how many of you, if you didn't just see the slide that I accidentally put forward to, know what the term hazard mitigation means by a show of hands? All right, that's about a third to a half. It's a clunky term. It's FEMA's term. I don't really like it, but I use it all the time. It's in my title. Uh, hazard <laughs> mitigation is essentially resilience. It's our ability to avoid or remove altogether our vulnerability to natural hazards. So this is a quick graphic, or an image rather, of a home that was destroyed during Tropical Storm Irene in Pittsfield, Vermont. Uh, this is considered a buyout. Uh, we do a lot of these in Vermont. We did a lot after Irene, but this is just a quick example of how you can remove a vulnerability to a natural hazard entirely and therefore not have a disaster when it comes. So this house was destroyed. Uh, we came in and bought it with FEMA funding and also Community Development Block Grant funding through ACCD. And we're able to get these homeowners back to 100% of their pre-disaster value, even though this house would clearly not go for much on the market. And then the, the requirement of that grant program mandates that that home, or that parcel rather, be left as open space in perpetuity. It's now functioning floodplain. When the water rises, nothing's going to happen there. If there's nothing in the way, a flood isn't really a disaster, is it? So that's, we, we do a lot of these, we do a lot of other things. I'm going to talk about them a bit more, but that's the easiest way to describe it. Hazard mitigation, climate resilience, they're kind of one and the same. Uh, I think when, I, when Jamie asked me to present here, I was trying to think of, well, what's the audience going to look like? And I just asked you, thank you. Um, but I also wanted to understand what, what might be best. Oh, I broke the mic. I hit the switch. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I was trying to think, well, if we have a room of academics and nonprofit organizations and the cultural and cultural historic preservation friends and, um, and organizations, agencies here, what are they going to want to talk about? Are they going to want to hear me talk about buyouts? Are they going to want to hear me talk about structural elevations of historic properties? Or are they going to want to hear about how they can make sure that their community is considering these types of projects and these types of important facilities in their planning. This is an emergency planning. This is local hazard mitigation planning. And each community in the state of Vermont should have one. They don't all have them, but most of them do. And we regularly see, as we review them at BEM, that oftentimes cultural and historic facilities, the historic societies, aren't included in those planning efforts. So if there is a library, for instance, in a downtown, imagine that. It's probably in a floodplain. And if it's in a floodplain and they have all these incredible resources, but they don't know that this type of planning exists and there's funds potentially out there to protect them from future floods, then they're missing that opportunity altogether. So if, you're, if you take one thing from my speech here away, I would just say look to your community or to your state agency or to your, no offense, remember, um, your academics and make sure that you're capturing all of those vulnerabilities that you see in your field, that you see uh, structurally, but also resources like archives. They're, they aren't structures, but they are important for our, um, our cultural resilience. Uh, so a quick overview of what local mitigation planning looks like. You have a description of your actual planning process, wherein hopefully each of you are at your community tables, making sure that you're identifying your vulnerabilities and your capabilities to respond to disasters. Um, an inventory of the community's natural hazards, flood, 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 maybe a wildfire, and then maybe a landslide. <laughs> um, inventory of your capabilities, so your community's capabilities and all of the entities therein, and your ability to address those hazards and reduce your vulnerability. 
And then there's actually a list of specific mitigation actions that should be identified. Upsize that culvert, remove that flood vulnerable home, elevate that cultural facility, buy a generator for a critical facility. Those are all things that you can include, very, very specific. And this is where you can make sure that your community is considering the cultural and arts um, and historic preservation side of the fence. Um, and then just one more example. Off the top of my head, I've not forgotten which town this is. I think it's the town of Lincoln. It is, it is. Oh, yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so this is just a quick example of, um, of something called floodproofing. This is actually called dry floodproofing. It's somewhere in between hazard mitigation and emergency planning. This is not a permanent retrofit structure. These are small aluminum shields that each weigh, I think they're like six or eight pounds. So the average person can pick each of them up. You have to understand that a flood event is coming, so that's kind of that's kind of why it's not complete vulnerability reduction, but it's somewhere in between. If you know you're going to have a high water event or a high precipitation event, these community members can go out, insert the little slats pretty easily and quickly, and then in the next picture over, you can see that the water actually came up about four feet in this event, and this was several years ago now. They've had a few actually since then, um, and it, inside is completely dry. They have to every now and then bring a little mop for a little bit of water that's leaked through, but that's it. And that's something that you can do with FEMA mitigation funding. So um, in addition to the planning and the different types of things you can do, a uh, reminder that buyouts are an opportunity, remove of structure, vulnerability entirely, flood plan gets to be happy and open, uh, structural and or utility elevation. So something that I always say that surprises people is that in addition to physically lifting a home out of the floodplain, footprint's still in, but the building itself is up above the first floor, uh, above the floodplain, you can actually you t uh, elevate your utilities too. So a lot of our structures in Vermont have um, first floors that are already above the floodplain, but lots of basements. And in those basements, we have a lot of our utilities. You can get FEMA funding to elevate those utilities to the first floor. And that's really important, especially for cultural and historic facilities that are old and have basements and have kept that out so they can preserve their room on the first and second and third floors for uh, community access. Uh, Seth's going to talk about floodplain and wetland restoration, so I won't, but you can do that with my funding. Um, and there are other opportunities also. They're on the VEM, Vermont Emergency Management website. Uh, happy to answer more questions after all this is over. Seth, do you want up here? here? I'll wander around. Wander. So I'm Seth Jensen from the Warren County Planning Commission. I'm going to give you some examples of um, some mitigation projects, including the planning for mitigation uh, that directly relate to cultural and historic resources. Uh, many of them are going to be in the village of Jeffersonville. Um, there's one example from the neighboring community in the village of Johnson. Um, so just some quick background, that historic development pattern of uh, compact villages surrounded by open working countryside that is mentioned in a lot of our planning documents um, presents some challenges in the state of Vermont because most of our historic settlements surrounded by open countryside were built next to water. Um, when you're next to water, you have to deal with flooding. Um, that is the case in the village of Jeffersonville. That's the case for most of the villages and downtowns in Lamoille County. Um, Moyle County, uh, like many rural areas of Vermont, has narrow river valleys surrounded by steep mountainsides, so you're either in a floodplain or a steep slope. Uh, both of those uh, topographies have hazards associated with them. Um, because of the location of uh, Lamoille County at the headwaters of three of the major rivers that flow into Lake Champlain, um, as of 2015, and I haven't check these numbers since then, so they may have changed, but as of 2015, Lamoille County, in terms of total number of federal uh, disaster uh, declarations, was in the top 200 uh, in the country and the top uh, number of total declared disasters since 1950 in the state of Vermont. Now that's total number of disasters, not total value of damages. Um, those numbers are a little different. Um, that development pattern 
uh, that we have and that topography has meant that many of our villages are vulnerable um, at the 10-year uh, to 50-year uh, flood stage as opposed to the 100-year um, flood stage. So that means that the level of vulnerability that we're planning for is a little bit different than um, sort of the typical FEMA standard of the 100-year uh, flood, um, which just gets to some interesting discussions when you're working through uh, FEMA stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about working with FEMA stuff. Um, so the village of Jeffersonville is located at the confluence of the Brewster River, which um, comes off the north slopes of Mount Mansfield, um, and the Lamoille River. Um, the Lamoille River is either the French word for marrow, because it's the river in between the other two rivers, or the French word for seagull, depending on which myth that is probably wrong about how the river was named uh, you believe in. Um, so in 2011, uh, the village of Jeffersonville experienced three major floods that inundated the village and actually required uh, some road closures, uh, damaged uh, homes and businesses, and required evacuation of the uh, senior housing, which is this large uh, building right there. Um, the first two events were in April and May. The spring flooding was actually worse in Lamoille County than Tropical Storm Irene. Um, Tropical Storm Irene also impacted the village. This is what it looked like in 2011. Um, you see several of those are pictures of the historic streetscape, the uh, Church Street and Main Street um, inundated with water. You can see in the top corner there the um, senior housing. Uh, the senior housing was elevated when it was constructed to be above the 100-year flood elevation, but the access road was not. Um, and for senior housing especially, where there's a sensitive population that may need access to medical care, that's not a great uh, situation. So because that flooding happened uh, in April and May, as opposed to the height of tourism season, um, Smuggler's Notch Resort was able to um, basically provide uh, the people free housing through uh, until the waters receded. Had that happened in leaf season, when Irene happened, that probably would not have been an option. Um, then in the middle is a picture of the old uh, sawdust silos from the former Bellgates lumber mill. Um, keep that silo in mind because it becomes important at the end of the presentation. Um, at about eight months after the village uh, experienced this very uh, major flood event, um, Vermont Life, uh, which used to be Vermont's tourism print uh, publication, um, published an article in Jeffers about Jeffersonville that basically advertised to the world how hideously ugly the village was when approaching it from Route 15. Now, the hook was that, but if you get past the fact that all you see is a derelict lumber mill and go into the village, there's some great libraries and cultural events and museums, but the people in Jeffersonville kind of didn't read past the line that said their community sucked, because most people wouldn't. Um, so that, after sort of this traumatic uh, natural event, was not a great mood in the community. Um, so the community uh, had now some pretty big discussions about what to do, and some pretty strong feelings about uh, what to do. And um, they actually approached the Regional Planning Commission um, and asked it for help figuring out what to do. Um, because this is a real challenge. Um, you can't really just lift up an entire village and move it, um, but you have these major vulnerabilities. Um, so what do you do? Um, one of the things, very happy accident that happened was um, the first we organized some meetings, we helped the village receive funding, a planning grant through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Um, the first meeting that we held uh, for that process was held at, was uh, in one of the buildings owned by the Historical Society. Um, and the guy from the Historical Society who came to unlock the door 
actually had access, because he worked for the historical society, to lots of old images and maps of the village. Um, something that was really interesting is this uh, pre-1950s uh, picture of the village. Um, you can't, didn't come out great, but if you see along here, the dotted area is the mapped 100-year floodplain. Something that immediately jumps out is that, look at that, in the pre-1950s, most of the village was on the high ground outside of the floodplain. So what happened, this is what happened. Um, when Route 15 was built, it was um, built to take traffic out of the village center uh, by building on the flat ground next to the Lamoille River. Um, I actually read the Lamoille County Regional Plan from that era, and it talked about how what a great idea that was. Um, so there's possibly some blame to my organization in addition to the Agency of Transportation here. Um, so what happens when you build a uh, state highway through open green space is that development happens along it. Um, so all of this new fill um, basically creates a barrier that keeps the Brewster River from making it to the Lamoille River and holds it back like a dam. And it just so happens that in the path of that dam is the village of Jeffersonville. So one of the things that this helped us understand was why the mapped 100 year floodplain bore almost no relationship to where the village of Jeffersonville actually experienced flooding. The, um, it just didn't take into account that major piece of infrastructure. Um, so in that planning process, one of the um, things that, that we did was really just take all of the ideas that people had for addressing flooding and worked with an engineering firm to develop a hydro hydraulic model to test what would happen. Um, and that's the list of all of the ideas that came up, and we tested, I think, several dozen. Um, what we learned uh, was what I just told you about. It was a human-built infrastructure was exacerbating the natural conditions. Um, VTrans did, was not going to agree to just digging up all of Route 15, um, so we asked them to let us dig up part of it. And we actually really did do that. And, um, <laughs> So there were two really high priority, high impact uh, mitigation projects. One uh, involved um, replacing the Cambridge Greenway Bridge, uh, which was an old railroad bridge um, that was severely, severely undersized for the river, and we'll see some pictures of that, um, as well as putting some strategically placed uh, culverts into Route 15. Um, the modeling also showed that um, putting some culvers into the Route 108 bridge that was under construction at the time uh, would have also alleviate um, flooding. Uh, when we told the Agency of Transportation that we wanted to put holes in the abutment that they had just built, they said no. Um, there were also floodplain restoration opportunities along the river and then targeted elevation uh, floodproofing and biomes. So one of the things that came out of this uh, process is that the village actually purchased the green space that were, remained from the historic uh, Bell Gates lumber mill, which was really the last major undeveloped property in the floodplain. Um, that was really a very critical, uh, critical decision by the village. Um, so the way the hazard mitigation grant program works is that after a declared disaster, a certain amount of money becomes, a percentage of the total damages becomes available for mitigation to prevent future damages. So there was a lot of damage in the state of Vermont after uh, Tropical Storm Irene. Um, the price tag of these first uh, two projects was more than a million dollars. and. Village of Jeffersonville, like many of your communities, did not have more than a million dollars just sitting in a bank. Um, so it became very clear that if the village was going to do that in this generation, they needed to pull together and do it while those, those funds were available. So one of the lessons to think about here is 
planning ahead means you are ready to take advantage of unforeseen opportunities that arise. If you don't plan ahead, you probably won't be able to do things like this unless you're crazy because the village actually hadn't planned ahead um, and it had some crazy people involved who helped move it forward. So I'm gonna talk more about that Cambridge Greenway Bridge uh, replacement project. So this is the project uh, that's complete. Um, it's very nice and pretty. This is what it looked like before. Uh, this was a picture taken by the chair of the select board in April 2014 right after we finished the modeling and told them that um, we need you to come up with a million dollars to replace a bridge that isn't actually failing. Um, and the chair of the select board kind of looked at us like that was a crazy idea. And we just suggested to him that the next time that there was a, you know, a, a flood, he'd just go and look for, to himself, for himself. He did, he took this picture the next day on my voicemail, there was a mes message from him that said, get that bridge out of there, put a new bridge in, and do it without costing any money to my local property taxpayers. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and the only reason we did was because of those um, funds that became available through the Hazard Mitigation uh, Grant Program and the CDBG Disaster Relief uh, Program. So just to give you a sense of, well, let's go back. Um, so that's actually a bridge that was installed shortly after the 1927 uh, flood. Um, the bridge itself is a historic resource, so there's a, just a little bit of a challenge to think about here, is what do you do when one historic resource is increasing the vulnerability to another historic resource? There's not a really good, clear, easy answer to that, but as we're dealing with these increasing, uh, frequent uh, events that cause an increasing amount of damage, it's a discussion that we're going to have to have. Which resources do we preserve by documenting them, and which ones do we preserve by actually preserving them as you know, in place? And in this case, which ones do we preserve by documenting and then finding a reuse location? Um, so this bridge was not scrapped um, based on the guidance from the state SHPO office. It was uh, removed and relocated to another area of the town of Cambridge. Um, I figured I should probably get that out there given the topic of this discussion. So this is what the river looked like shortly after the bridge was pulled. Um, that old abutment, see how it squeezes into the river. So what was happening is the abutments, and this is the way we built bridges uh, before we had heavy, heavy equipment, was you built, you, you squeezed in the river because the, the longer your span, the more expensive the bridge. Um, so the abutments moved into the river, um, and the bridge was also had a, had a very large steel plate that dropped three feet down uh, from the deck of the bridge. So it was basically in, in three different dimensions restricting the flow of the Brewster River. And at the two-year stage, um, water would begin backing up uh, into the uh, into the river channel, and at around the five to 10 year stage, it would actually overflow and get into the village. So keep that circles there from a reason. Keep an eye on that uh, clump of trees and where the old abutment is. Um, the middle abutment, as you can see, is about five feet farther back than the old abutment. And here's the completed bridge, and you can see uh, through there uh, where that clump of trees is. So we didn't just uh, pull back um, the, to the, the, the bank full width of the river channel. Um, when the railroad was built, they filled in a, a, a large amount of the floodplain in that area. Um, we actually removed uh, um, lots and lots of fill to get match um, match the what the elevation in that area would have been um, to give the river even more room to uh, to flood. Um, this is a picture from the uh, December twenty three flooding that happened this year. Um, so we talk about what happens when there's a flood, uh, you know, during a, a major uh, important event. Um, 
somewhat poetically uh, in Lamoille County and I think in other communities on both um, the, the uh, Christmas weekend and Easter uh, weekend there uh, were flood events um, that based on the modeling would have inundated the village if not for this project. Um, so in one year, two really important uh, holiday weekends, um, people were able to stay home and celebrate as opposed to evacuate um, because of this, this project. So we often, you know, in FEMA, we talk about cost benefit. There's a whole ratio. Um, it's very mathematical. It's very subjective, but I think it's a very strong subjective uh, reason of why, why a project like this would happen. Um, resiliency, you know, we talk a lot about the kind of physical form, but resiliency is also about the strength of the community. Um, this is from last year, around this time last year. Um, the last part of this project was planting that, um, that floodplain. And what I love about this picture is you have people from three different generations uh, in this space um, helping to restore the, the floodplain. One of the people in this picture when we presented the uh, project um, actually yelled at me about all the money you're going to spend and if you just would let us dredge the river, we wouldn't have to do this. And one of the things that we learned from the modeling was that by, by opening this channel up, um, it would actually help the river uh, better transport the sediment out. Um, and I, I told him that. I told him that was what the what was going to happen, and it would actually help the river remove the sediment that he was viewing as a, as a problem. He didn't believe me, and he told me he would check, and he actually came up to me after and said, I've been watching, I've been checking every time it rains, and you're right. So that's another one of those subjective examples, and I wasn't right, I didn't, I didn't know any of that stuff. We had engineers working with us, and I just tell them what, what they tell me is going to happen, because apparently they know what they're doing. Which is good. Engineers should know what they're doing. Um, so that's part of, um, I think part of what's important about this is people becoming invested in their communities and seeing a hope for the future of their communities. That is something that this community had lost after those uh, three flood events and that unfortunate article. Um, and I think seeing them reclaim it has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. Um, one of the, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, home elevations. Um, even with all of that, there were still gonna be vulnerable structures. It's just the reality of a village next to a river. Um, one of those structures is this uh, home, the red one, um, which is a historic home. Uh, I think it's the second oldest home in the village. Um, Elevated historic structures means changing their relationship to the surrounding ground, which has issues that you have to address to be historically sensitive. Um, so one of the things that we worked with with this property owner was to visualize what that would look like. This is a, um, a computer-generated simulation. This is their simulation to understand what it was going to mean for them unloading firewood. Uh, so. This is pre-elevation location of the porch where they pull up their pickup truck and unload firewood. This is post-elevation where it was going to be. Um, that just gives you a sense of how much needed to happen uh, to move this home out of the floodplain. Um, this is Suruba, the loyal steed, watching the, horde, the, the house be uh, elevated and very confused about what was happening. So, what, so rural Vermont, dealing with elevations means dealing with all of the normal FEMA stuff you have to deal with and firewood and livestock. Um, it's complicated. Um, this is the home uh, complete uh, with the elevation now. Um, and they really did a good job of matching and trying to restore the historic uh, context or maintain the historic context we get to time and questions, we can talk about how that works with FEMA or doesn't work with FEMA, um, as the case might be. Um, but these are things, when you're thinking about a historic resource in your village or downtown, um, 
you know, there are things you can do to protect them and still maintain the historic character. That's the lesson of that. Um, this is one more structure. This is the Johnson uh, Public Library. Um, not in Jefferson, but it's in Johnson. That's the name, Johnson Public Library. Um, nice old uh, building of that era. This is what happens in Johnson when the um, Guyon floods. Um, and you can see that the waters come right up to the uh, basement of the building. The, like most old buildings in Vermont, the basement is used for storage, it's used for heating system, it's used for um, uh, storage and um, electric equipment. Um, we actually worked with the community to figure out what to do about this, and all of the options for um, FEMA level mitigation were out of range of what the community could, could afford, and that includes the match. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, um, well, it's not really unfortunate that there were not millions of dollars of HMGP money and CDBG disaster relief money because that means there hadn't been another hurricane that devastated the state. Um, but the result of that was that the resources were not available uh, for, for this community. So what they are doing instead is sort of a, a temporary uh, fix of moving what they can, the furnace system, the utilities, the storage, um, out of the basement into less vulnerable areas and um, being really smart and careful about monitoring uh, what happens and the levels of the river. Um, so that is even if there are not millions of dollars on the table, the lesson of this is there are some things you can do and uh, planning ahead is still uh, worth it. Um, last slide for me, uh, these are those silos that Vermont Life uh, said were an awful blight on the landscape, um, completely independent of any of the Regional Planning Commission, the Local Arts Council um, applied for an animating in infrastructure grant to uh, put murals on those, um, those silos. And people now stop uh, to take pictures of that. Um, and one of the great things is that um, when the village of Jeffersonville wrote their 2012 plan, it was a, that picture we showed at the beginning of the village underwater. Uh, when they just revised their plan for 2019, this is the picture on the cover. And so um, just you know, many times in rural Vermont, the story isn't always good right now. Um, we talk a lot about um, the challenges rural Vermont is facing. Um, but I just want to leave with the thought that resiliency is about the people and investing in the people and empowering the people of those, those communities. Um, when uh, uh, entities like the Regional Planning Commission, state agencies like the EM, the Shippo's Office, VTRANS and others uh, work as partners um, and, and have a role that goes beyond permanent grant compliance, um, Vermont communities can do amazing things and that is really key. Um, to overcoming the challenges many of our communities are facing. Uh, I'm right-handed. Uh, it's my name is Ben Havoc. I'm the uh, team leader of Property Care for Historic New England. Historic New England is a regional heritage organization. Uh, we do many things, but my job there is the uh, preservation and maintenance of our 37 historic sites. That's about 160 buildings and uh, about 1,300 acres of uh, land and its various uh, facets. Uh, so at Historic New England, um, uh, we've we defined uh, resiliency as uh, having the capacity to prevent, withstand, respond to, and recover from disruptions to our museum site structures and collections. And of course, that's a wide range of activities, whether it's a car hitting your uh, 1770s house or uh, uh, any number of issues, flooded basements or trees down. Uh, but all of our kind of actions over the years, we realized uh, the natural events were the ones that really demanded a lot of our time. Uh, so we did start to focus on 
the climate, the weather, and then inevitably uh, climate change. And again, there's a lot of different facets to climate change. Uh, we've talked about flooding. I'm worried about rain all the time. And so uh, for New England, uh, you know, the statistics are general precipitation is up five inches uh, you know, over the last 100 years. But uh, more importantly is when that rain falls. And it's not spread out. It's when you have an intense rainstorm, it's, it's raining even more intense. And so that has implications for uh, all buildings, but obviously uh, historic structures uh, uh, specifically. Uh, and for a reason that will become obvious in a, in a second, uh, I happen to know that in Maine, uh, rainfall intensity numbers, so, so the amount of rain you might have in a 10-year storm, it has increased 25% uh, since uh, 1978. So this isn't like 2% statistical aberration. This is, this is a lot of more rain that we're seeing. Uh, what is that rain? We, we've talked about storm inundation, tidal flooding, localized flooding. Uh, most of this rain is uh, now accompanied with 50 mile an hour winds or more. Uh, that's causing an effect, whether it's blowing the rain in or blowing your trees down. Uh, so we're thinking about that all the time and it's overwhelming all of our drainage systems, gutters, the site drainage, uh, all aspects of how we try to move water away from our buildings. And that creates uh, accelerated building and landscape damage, uh, increased habitat for pests, increased risk to the collections in the houses, and then, of course, increased risk to the visitors who are visiting your site. Uh, what we realized is we're doing all of these different things to preserve the houses, uh, but if we just change how we think about it, it becomes a resiliency plan. Uh, because we still need to take care of the trees, whether the wind's blowing them down or not, and we still need to replace our roofs, do gutter work, uh, cladding, site drainage, all of these things happen, but now we're saying, what's different? Like, how should we, should we approach these, uh, these aspects a little bit differently now that we know uh, maybe perhaps the traditional way we've approached them doesn't quite work? Just as some examples, we have, um, uh, what I like to think is a fairly good kind of emergency preparedness system. We talk about it a lot. We talk about how we're going to react to different issues. We engage all aspects of our organization in it. We try to talk about um, how we handle collections in an in event, how we do different aspects. So, so we are talking about uh, emergencies on a regular basis. Uh, tree care has, has for the last 10 years been an important part of our management of our historic properties. Uh, I would say actually the amount of damage we actually sustain from trees is very minimal and I credit the amount of money we invest in caring for the trees. Uh, we have spent a lot of time trying to get the water away from our buildings and this was before we even mentioned the word climate change within my organization, and it's complex at a historic site because we've got archaeological resources uh, below grade. Uh, you don't want to change the historic landscape very much, so how do you get all of this happening? And then that's a big site-wide project. In the meantime, we still need to just get water away from you know, the foundation whatever way we can. So we, we engage both small scale and big scale. Uh, and then very quickly, we have been noting uh, an uptick in a, ver a variety of pests within our museums. Uh, and that a lot of that seems to be with changing conditions we're experiencing, whether the basement is a little bit wetter, uh, that's a different habitat, the, the, the temperatures we're seeing, even March, the bugs aren't really dying the way they used to die over the winter, so we're seeing that. Uh, so the infestation doesn't really die out, it just keeps uh, repopulating. Uh, greater and greater. Uh, so I said, we, we do this already. We, we prepare gutters, we fix gutters, uh, but we decided to put a new lens on it. And that was the, what is really happening uh, with our gutters? Are they good enough for today's rainstorms? And then carrying that forward, uh, if rain, if climate change really does make rain more and more intense storms over the next 20, 30 years, are we actually prepared for that? Uh, and what are our failure points? And this is a very abbreviated uh, presentation, so I'm just cutting to the summary, which is uh, gutter capacity, or its ability to carry water, is basically based on, uh, they design around a 10-year storm, 
uh, we found that uh, half of the gutters in our study, and it was, it was called the Maine uh, gutter study because we looked at um, nine sites in the state of Maine, uh, and we looked at 21 gutter systems. Half of them basically failed just a standard you know, uh, design guideline for today. Uh, three quarters failed that worst case scenario, which is the 100 year storm. Uh, so, so across the board, we were looking at uh, high failure rates for our gutters to be able to carry water uh, away from our building. Um, this was uh, shocking to me. I did not want to hear that. Uh, and, uh, and the more, uh, I think, alarming statistic was anywhere we had a wood gutter, a nice good wood gutter because we're a historic organization, that was almost 100% failure rate, even at the 10-year storm. Now, uh, downspout, so gutters, I was specifically talking about that horizontal thing at the roof line, the downspout, well actually, once the water gets the downspout, it was tended to be fine, whether we had you know, big corrugated aluminum downspouts or you know, metal round uh, downspouts, whatever it was, it tended to carry the water that got there, uh, but maybe it wasn't really getting there because the gutter was too small, or more significantly, the outlet, the little device that connects the gutter to the downspout. Uh, and what we found over and over again, no matter how big your gutter is, you might have just had this tiny pipe uh, to connect it to your downspout. So again, the size of the downspout doesn't matter because only so much water is getting there. Uh, and in fact, um, statistically, it was about a 50% uh, failure rate when we, when we ran the calculations uh, and found that, well, almost globally, if you had an outlet that was less than two inches, uh, you were failing, failing the calculations, and if you had over two inches, uh, you were generally passing. Uh, so, so this was all very uh, interesting to me. Um, made me think that, uh, well, first of all, our historic gutter systems are gonna fail, and, and they're failing now, so regardless of what happens with future climate change, uh, we're, we're already in a failure point. The water is not going where we want it to go. Uh, historic structures are already prone to water damage, so now we're intensifying that with our gutter systems. Uh, being a good 110-year-old historic preservation organization, we replace in kind, and that means we take what we have and we replace it exactly the way it is. That can't keep going, and that's a shocking thing for my organization to uh, come to grips with because that is the cornerstone of what we do. Uh, but we can't just keep putting a wooden gutter up if it's going to fail and not carry the water away from the building. What point is that going to serve? Uh, and uh, new design standards need to be considered. Uh, the 10-year storm for us isn't a good design guideline. It's, it's too small. And if we're predicting the lifespan of a gutter, we need to predict out what the rain's gonna be in the future. So we're, we're playing around with a lot of different concepts uh, right now on how we take these findings and put it into um, application. Now, uh, the final thing I'll talk about since I'm in Vermont uh, is that we actually have a two-year partnership with Middlebury College, uh, and it's built around resiliency. How great that I'm here talking about it. Uh, so the first year of the project, we had a, one intern, uh, and uh, she worked with us. She helped us come up with that definition of resiliency. She looked at a lot of things, helped us actually say, hey, we have this framework already. You do these things already. Let's, let's repackage it. Uh, we just started year two, Monday. Uh, we have three interns this year uh, looking at a wide range of activities, not just rain, but rain, sea level uh, rise, how that's affecting, we looked at a, we're looking at a cluster of four properties we have, and we're trying to look at how all of these different things may affect our historic sites, or uh, rising water table, how that's gonna affect, are we gonna, we built a drainage system in one of our sites, uh, is that gonna be no longer good because the water table is saturating that, those drainage elements? We're trying to kind of do this analysis uh, so that we're better uh, positioned uh, and we've always been really good about single site uh, work. That's kind of what the cornerstone of my organization. Uh, but we know it's a bigger problem. And how do we, just like they were saying, how do we better integrate with local and regional planning uh, as part of that? And of course, we have actually meetings set up with our regional planners who are doing a lot of work in the town that uh, we're looking at so that we can start to 
kind of broaden our conversation about how we integrate, uh, not just at the site level, but also uh, kind of at the community level. Um, and with that, I'm cool. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, a couple of things just to tie a few things together. Uh, what we're doing uh, these days at the division, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we're focusing on doing survey in these flood prone areas so that we can have the recordation and the documentation of these historic resources prior to these incidents happening. Um, helping to identify some of the best practices. I know that when we talk about hazard mitigation stuff, I would prefer the elevations often. The buyouts are easier though, and, and, and so there, none of this comes easy, but the more information that we have available, uh, even some of the projects that seem easy, it, it can be hard to get there sometimes. And also just as, as a conduit to uh, continue to bring technical assistance to folks and support the networks that are developing because it really is a uh, needs for a collaborative effort here. So with that, I just wanted to open it up. Uh, if there are any questions or comments? Anyone had any specific questions? Yeah. My question is about this space where we have lost nation. Uh, I'm wondering if that has anything to do with the Abernathy Indians. I'm Anybody not sure. Anybody know anything about that? I have to ask the folks here. It's it's Kathleen, perhaps. So. Uh, hi. Who has a question? I, I'm asking oh, about. Hi. I, I'm acting. I'm asking about this space. Yes. Lost Nation. Does mm -hmm. that have anything to do with the Abenaki Indians? Um, not directly. No. Um, Lost Nation. Our founder and uh, our founding artistic director Kim Beck is a native Vermonter. Uh, sixth or seventh generations. He grew up in <clears throat> the Braintree area, looking across at a mountain range that was is known to people uh, in the area as Lost Nation. It's not on the map. And as he traveled around, he realized that there were many Lost Nations across the country, and that the were they were inevitably rural areas, nebulous boundaries, oftentimes not on the map. So for him, when he came back to Vermont, it was a way for him to commit to being in Vermont and committing to a specific place in a specific community, but sort of also being out there on the frontier doing um, new things and creating new spaces. Um, I thought it was but an unusual it, name. Yes, a lot of people yeah, think it's either political or, or uh, Native American. Um, it's a little bit of both. I, I think he's a, a one-eighth, he's got one-eighth, uh, one-sixteenth, one-sixteenth uh, Native American Abenaki uh, blood. blood. Yeah, but if you come and see a show here at Lost Nation, the explanation is in our playbill. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, so uh, replacing, replacing not in time. So is there a protocol or thoughts moving ahead with what do you put in place of historic wood gutters? Bigger historic wood gutters? Uh, <laughs> right, so it's, it's a challenge. Uh, uh, we're also recognizing that it might not be all or nothing. Uh, that we have massive built-in wooden gutter that we had no desire to do anything with, but the outlet was an inch and a half. All the damage we were seeing was at that end where the outlet is. So we made the outlet bigger, and we're going to watch, and we're going to see what happens and see if that does it. I will say that we had two wooden gutters that we had replaced uh, previously with copper in the outline of the uh, original uh, profile of the wooden gutter. Uh, both of those uh, passed both calculation tests, 100 year storm uh, included. So I think alternative materials to wood uh, is going to be another uh, conversation point. I just had a follow up question. So with the gutter replacements, would this have to go through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as part of a mitigation process or uh, through well, your own state preservation office? Uh, so I work for a private nonprofit. Uh, so uh, the answer is complicated. Uh, <laughs> we're in uh, 22 different communities and five states, not in Vermont, I know. Uh, but the um, uh, if, there, if we're in a local historic uh, district, we would need to get approval. Uh, and we did get the approval for the, the, the enlargement of the outlet. Actually, we had to get state approval because it was a change 
Uh, I've applied to state agencies for changing a couple other gutters. Uh, and uh, so, so it depends uh, who has jurisdiction on, on the property. Uh, some properties, no one has jurisdiction except ourselves. Uh, so, so that gives us a different uh, latitude. Question over here. Uh, kind of a question for both Ben and for uh, Lauren um, about just kind of mitigation. So I think even the best planned out kind of downspouts or gutters don't work if the gutter's full of leaves just like every other gutter in the open we get. So well, what steps is historic New England taking to kind of making sure that they're staying on top of that and all the other maintenance things that are required for making sure that water stays away. And then also, is there funding out there? Because that's a type of mitigation is, is taking care of the things that are in place already. Uh, well, I really like that angle uh, because no preservation grant will, will give you money for maintenance or painting for some reason. Uh, you know, so I'd love to know if FEMA would give me money. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to uh, step up everywhere uh, proactive maintenance activities. Uh, but gutters are tough. Uh, you know, you're either up there every week or you're going to have a clogged gutter. I think the realization for us is that some of the damage that we were seeing was not a result of clogged gutters. It was actually something entirely different. So it's not to say we shouldn't clean our gutters. That is still a major issue for us. But uh, it was kind of, oh, that's this house that's 40, you know, the gutter's 40 feet up in the air and there is no trees nearby and we've never seen a leaf in there. We're still getting the same damage you would think you would get from a clogged gutter. And so that, that's when, you know, we, we started really thinking about it in a different way. Uh, short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> FEMA, FEMA would not, they don't typically for mitigation projects do anything that would require ongoing maintenance. It really is to try to permanently remove or reduce the vulnerability. So their approach in the, in the gutter instance would be like make it a lot bigger, put a cover over it, and then get rid of the trees. So there are no leaves going forward. Like that, that's not an actual project that you could do. <laughs> in that project, in that uh, example, that's what you do with mitigation. Question here and then Tom. Yeah, I think um, you kind of made a comment about the replacing in time being a, a hard decision point for your organization. And as you can imagine, that's a hard decision point for a lot of communities that have to start preservation ordinances or plans. And I wonder if in any of the states or communities that you have properties, if you're aware that any of them have gone through a process of understanding or creating guidelines around replacement materials, if you know of any examples off the top of your head. Uh, well, that, that is a big, easy uh, subject. One, I will now plug my organization again. We're, we're diving into as well. Uh, I'm waiting to hear about a grant to do a testing program on alternative materials so that we can test certain aspects of how they look uh, on buildings. Uh, I would say it's really a community by community uh, example. I could point to the city of Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, the executive director there, the historical commission uh, is, is pro alternative materials where it makes sense. Uh, and so he is very open to that. Uh, we have found places uh, throughout uh, New England that are open to that, but many that are absolutely no way will never uh, approve it. And so we're looking, we're trying to look at the problem, look at the gutters, and then say, well, we have an issue here, we have some potential solutions, and now we want to kind of share it. Uh, to, to broaden the conversation, and we want to look at alternative materials in a general sense as well, or I should say substitute wood materials, uh, so that we can uh, figure out where we even stand on that as a general rule, and how, how we might be able to apply that uh, and work with local communities. Tom Jokers? Yeah, I think this is a really relevant, timely topic, and, and it, uh, really hinges a lot on communication and, and I think part of the message that I hope that we can all work towards is communicating with the engineering community, the architects and so on, times are changing and the, the old standards may not apply. Uh, even some of the, the uh, discussions that uh, uh, you gave us your wonderful uh, presentation on, on the issues in Jeffersonville and what about Act 250 and uh, you know, do we need to revisit some of these engineering standards to better evaluate potential impacts, natural as well as 
human made uh, uh, risk. So I, I, and I hope the human associated risk is also something that is not overlooked. We've heard a lot about the natural and to be sure, climate change and everything. But I mean, living in Burlington, Vermont, I, I worry about a Lake Megantic issue with fuel uh, a, a trains on the waterfront. If something were to happen there, what would happen to the city of 40,000 people? What could we drink? I mean, these kinds of severe risks really need to be part of the equation. And of course, it is also linked with storm events and everything else. So if we are, it seems like we're headed into a, a more challenging time, but to keep up with it. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, you asked about the question of Act 250. Um, and then a few things about the other thing. But um, for both of the mitigation projects, um, we worked very hard to convince the district coordinator that there was no Act 250 jurisdiction uh, for those projects. Um, and I think they, the arguments were uh, legitimate. Um, for the in, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I'm, I'm not in the office, so I think it's okay. <laughs> Many of our, uh, whether it's based on historic resources or natural resources, many of our permitting guidelines are based on no adverse impact. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, if you keep it pretty much how it is, things are going to be okay, is the underlying philosophy. Um, the lesson of all of the work we've done with Jeffersonville and with the flood modeling is that that's no longer a workable standard. Um, that's a huge issue for um, state level permitting as well as federal level permitting. Um, and um, it does mean that we have not a lot of time, if the climate change you know, projections pan out, not a lot of time to figure out what our new standards need to be. Um, so the last sort of piece of that is um, when the, the new bridge and roundabout will be built in 2010, the community actually raised questions to be trans about the flood impacts that two years later we modeled better. Um, and this is not to beat up on VTrans. They are working within the parameters that they are within uh, with federal guidelines that the, the community was saying you need to size these bigger because our observations are saying there's more water than your calculations are saying. And their response was we're meeting the regulations, we're meeting the standards, and those standards, again, not to be the VTrans, those standards are what federal highway will pay for. They're what they're authorized to do. Um, gosh, life would have been a lot different for Lauren and I over the last five years if VTrans had put in a culvert in the roundabout that was five times the size. Um, a lot of the stuff we've done would not have needed to be happening. We would have only needed to dig up Route 15 twice, but there's no way Federal Highway would have let VTrans do that. So we have to do something. Well, I just wanted, that's all we have time for today. I want to keep folks from the next session. I want to thank our, all of our presenters for their time and efforts here, and thank all of you for your attention. Hope you have a great rest of your day.